Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Senator David Waters, and uh, welcome to the Commission Offshore Wind and Port Development. Uh, my first duty is to read the right to know script. Uh, so I'm going to read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting that we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of the commission, I find that due to the state of the emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note, there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing uh, Zoom and live YouTube broadcasts for this meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on YouTube and via phone by following the directions and links provided in the general court website. We have provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar we are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remote senate at ledge.state.nh.us. That's remote senate at ledge.state.nh.us. Or you can call 603. 2713043. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, it will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. And finally, let's start the meeting today by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state where they are. And if anyone else is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Well, thank you. And Alan, if you could please call the roll. No problem, Senator. Thank you. Uh, so Senator David Waters. I am here in Dover alone in my room. Thank you. Uh, Representative Rennie Cushing. He's going to be absent today, Alan. All right. There you go. All right, uh, Representative Catherine Harvey. I'm, I'm here, I'm in my office and I'm alone. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Mayo. Right. Uh, Mark LaLiberté. I am here in my house in Candia and I am alone. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Couture. I'm in the office and alone. Thank you. Uh, Sherry Patterson. All right. Oh, and you know what? She had sent me an email. She is going to try to make it. She had a prior engagement. Sorry about that. Uh, Michael Berman. Here in Dover and I'm alone. Thank you. Uh, Sean Clancy. Here in my office at Great Bay Community College, and I'm alone. Thank you. Jim Tatone? I'm in Seabrook, and I'm alone. <laughs> Joseph Casey? I'm in Rochester, in my office, alone. Good to see you, Joe. Nice to uh, see you. Jennifer says? Good afternoon. I'm at my home office, and I am alone. Uh, Senator Jeb Bradley. All right. Uh, Representative Jane Bolio. Here, and I'm uh, in Manchester, um, home alone. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Representative Peter Somsich. All right. Uh, Taylor Caswell. Good afternoon, Taylor Castle. I'm in my office here in Concord and I'm alone. Thank you. 
uh, Ted Deers. Tired. This is Ted Deers. Uh, thanks. I am here in Concord at my home office and by myself. Thank you. Uh, Diane Martin. Hi, good afternoon. I am at my office in Concord alone. Thank you. Uh, Donald Kreese. He can't make it today, may join us later. Okay, great. Uh, Diane Foster. Good afternoon, I'm Diane Foster. I'm in my home office and I am alone. Thank you. Uh, Vandan Devasha. Good afternoon, Vandan Devatia. I'm in my home office and I'm all alone. Thank you. Uh, Tony Gunta. I'm going to make you all very jealous. I'm at my vacation home in Northport, Florida, but I am alone. <laughs> we'll come. We'll come join you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tim Roche. Hey, yeah, thanks. Uh, Tim Roche's home alone in Stratum. Thanks. Thank you very much. That concludes the roll call, Senator. Uh, thank you very much. Alan and uh, our next order of business is approval of the minutes uh, from the last meeting. These were sent around to you. And um, I, if anybody has any additions or corrections to the minutes, please. Uh, in. Right, I will take a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. So, so moved. And uh, do you have that person, or excuse me, Mark? Is that Mark? Yeah. And uh, then um, a second, please. I'll second the motion. Thank you. And Alan, if you would uh, again read the roll. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Well. Chairman, if I could, Mr. Chairman, if I could for one second. Uh, this, this is Glenn Brackett. Uh, my name wasn't on the roll call list, but I've been appointed by the Senate president to be on this commission. Yep, we got, we got you. I think that's a problem with the House clerk there, President Brackett. We will get that resolved. Uh, thank you. I will call the roll now. Um, Senator David Waters. Yes. Representative Cushing is out. Representative Harvey. Yes. Uh, Matthew Mayo. Yes, and I am here alone in Concord. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Glenn Brackett. Present. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Those are minutes. Uh, Stephen Kocher. I was not in attendance. I believe Ted Deers, who is our primary rep for DES, is in attendance. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sherry Passion. Michael Berman. Yes. Sean Clancy. John oh, Clancy yes. uh, for the minutes. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jim Tatone. Yes. Joseph Casey. Uh, I was not in attendance. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Sitt. Yes. Uh, Senator Jeff Bradley. I don't think he's joined yet. Okay. Uh, Representative Jane Bolio. Yes. Representative Somsich, has he joined us yet? No, okay. Uh, Taylor Caswell? I wasn't here for that meeting, so. All right. All right. Uh, Ted Deers? Yes. All right, Diane Martin? Yes. Donald Kreese? Diane Foster? Yes. Uh, Van Van Javatia? Yes. Tony Ginta? Yes. And Tim Roche? Yes. All uh, right. Just wanted to mention, I'm, I'm also here now. Oh, okay, great. Thank you very much. And uh, do you vote there to approve the minutes? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right, Senator, you got those minutes approved. Well, thank you uh, very much, everyone. It's awfully good to see you all and to hear hear you all. And uh, it's really nice to 
be involved in something that's so positive about the future of the of the state. And um, I was talking to the Dover Chamber of Commerce today uh, and mentioning this. And uh, let me tell you, local uh, communities with uh, industrial park land and other uh, desire to have businesses in the Seacoast region are really uh, looking forward to what we can do to help this process along. Um, the steering committee, which consists of myself and uh, Michael Berman and uh, Matt Melu and Mark Liberté, uh, met and um, we discussed uh, kind of an order of business and how we might move forward over the next several meetings. And it was our thought that it might be good because we are just starting out. And while some are, have great expertise in the subject and have heard many presentations, other are newer to it, that we could have another kind of an informational um, provided uh, a meeting that would cover a few topics. And then at the end of the meeting, we are gonna uh, present a longer list of potential topics uh, for subsequent uh, meetings, who we might bring in to hear from so that we understand the full ramifications of, of uh, offshore wind development and the impacts, of course, you know, fisheries and labor and um, other groups as well, just to, to make sure that we get the information um, that we need. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, but for today, uh, thanks to Michael Behrman, we have four great presentations. Um, Doug Feister, Managing Director of the Renewable Consulting um, Group, Annie Hawkins, Executive Director, Responsible Ocean Development Alliance, uh, Dan Shreve of Wood McKenzie, and Liz Burdock, Executive Director, Business Network for Offshore Wind. And I thought, Michael, actually, I might turn it over to you to provide a little more uh, introduction for each speaker. And I, I believe that's the order that we are planning to um, go in and that Alan has their presentations. And so with the magic of technology, we, this might even happen. So Michael, if you would, thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief as um, I did not pull together uh, any specific information on each uh, speaker. So I may just uh, actually kick it over to them and let them briefly introduce themselves. So we will uh, go in this order um, unless anybody has any particular issues with it. Um, so uh, if not, we will start with uh, Doug Feister from Renewable Consulting Group. Doug, are you there? Doug. Okay, maybe we will be changing this uh, slightly. I just asked him to unmute on our end. And also, um, Michael, do you see the ability to share a screen on yours? I'm just making sure that everybody does have the ability to do that so I don't have to do it for them if they do have the ability. Yes, I do see the ability on my end. Okay. All right, and it looks oh, like... There he is. Doug? I do see he is on with us. Yep. Uh, I think he might have just dropped off trying to get it to his audio to work. I think that's what happened. So we can move on to the next one. Up, yeah. oh, you're there. Okay. Yep. Okay, Doug. Yeah, I think we can hear you now. Doug, can you hear me? Michael? Yep. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry about that. I was dialing in on the phone just to avoid this uh, very, <laughs> very problem. But it was uh, th thanks. Thank you very much, Michael, for for inviting inviting me to present. It's an it's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the to the commission for for a allowing me to, to 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 come to this uh, really a, a very exciting uh, gathering that's that's uh, gr growing in your state uh, with respect to offshore wind. My name is Doug Feaster. I'm a managing director at a at a consultancy, a global consultancy called the Renewables Consulting Group, and uh, you can tell based on the name, we are we focus only on renewable energy around the globe, and we spend a heck of a lot of time uh, trying to advance uh, offshore wind in all different um, uh, spots um, in the U.S. and in Europe and in, in East Asia. So what I may do is just share my screen, Michael. Please, uh, please tell me if this isn't working at any point. Um, Is everyone able to see that screen? Yes, Doug. Superb. So this is just a basic, um, what I'd like to do is just have a basic uh, in introduction off for when we can, we can ask uh, uh, questions uh, afterwards and we can take deeper dives on all kinds of topics. 
it's, it's obviously a, a, a complex uh, technology. Um, it can also happen at re relatively large scales. So there are lots of questions about offshore wind. But I'm going to just provide a bit of an overview and then turn it over to the other speakers to focus on, uh, on, on, on other topics. But it was a, just um, intended as a bit of a, a stage setting um, um, a presentation here. Just quickly about RCG. We're a specialized expert services firm. We only focus, we only work on renewables. We have about 60 consultants globally um, in various parts of the world, Europe and um, Japan and Taipei, and then here um, in the Americas. About half of us are engineers and half of us do other things in the natural sciences or economics or law and other subjects. And we um, uh, provide, these are the kind of consulting services we provide, market intelligence, management consulting, and technical advisory. Just a map with our locations around the globe. Let me get, just get into the subject of, um, of, of offshore wind. I, I think uh, many of you know it's a, it's, it's a very large in, industry now since it got going in Denmark, uh, I guess about, about 30 years ago now, maybe more. Um, and this is, this is just an overview what, what it's showing you is, is actually showing you where um, offshore wind is really moving, not only in terms of the installed capacity, that's the nameplate capacity, it's the maximum output of any, any machine all aggregated together, but in, in terms of what's in the pipeline, uh, where, where, do, where do projects have offtake co contracts, where, do they have, where have they secured um, land rights, um, and so it's, you, can, you can see the sum there, three, almost 300 36,000 uh, megawatts, 336 gigawatts globally between those that are in operation, that's about 27,000 megawatts um, secured um, and in, in, in development. You can see the leaderboard there with actually a lot in China, but also a lot happening in the, in the UK and in the US because of the great, great potential here. Not so much because of of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Block Island wind farm that is, that is spinning and, and the Virginia project that is now um, spinning, but really mainly because of the, the offtake commitments and because of the, the large, uh, large potential along our coast. We go to the next slide, just a little bit more um, on <clears throat> what we should be seeing uh, globally. Just you can see that, that, that growth rate and you can see the distribution among, among the regions there between uh, Europe, which is uh, EMEA, um, Europe, Middle East, and, Asia, and uh, Africa, APAC, excluding China, and also the Americas there. Um, you can see the dark blue is, is Europe with Asia coming in in about 2021, 2022, and then the Americas really coming in with some of the projects that are already contracted uh, on, on the East Coast there in that kind of beige uh, color uh, approaching a cumulative gigawatts of about um, about 55, uh, again about 55,000 megawatts. And then we, um, we did just a little quick little exercise here uh, um, where we compared Europe and the United States, uh, both both in terms of their cumulative um, megawatts expected by 2025, and then seeing how those megawatts um, uh, are distributed across the developers, across the project. Uh, Owners, and you can see some overlap between maybe some names you've seen here in the U.S. and those that are that are established um, players in Europe, uh, names like uh, Orsted and um, Equinor and Iberdrola and RWE. You can see some of those are some of the main big players in Europe. I will say there are a lot of other smaller players. That's that beige, that beige area there on the left, and then the United States. Some of those names being repeated, but then other names like like the, some of the local utilities here. Uh, Eversource and Renexia, which is an, an, an Italian developer, and, and Dominion and SIP, which is short for the Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners. And it's a big, it's a big industry. And when, we, when we see this industry really grow, we're going to see um, a lot spent on uh, on development, which is that dark blue shading there on the left, on capital expenditures, and and on operating these wind farms. Um, and it's approximately an $80 billion dollar industry for the U.S. by 2030 um, across these states that have all committed uh, to offshore wind. 
um, uh, from Massachusetts uh, down down to Virginia. And you can see that graph there, um, that graph there on the right across those six states. What I want to spend a little more time on, though, is to just to talk about the nuts and bolts, a little bit about the nuts and bolts of offshore wind <clears throat> and the life cycle uh, of offshore wind. Some of you might be familiar with the life cycles of of a, of a solar project, solar PV project, utility scale project, or an onshore wind project. And you can see this, the, the, the phases are, are, are very, very similar, uh, if not uh, almost identical. It's really mainly about the specific steps that, that are taken and the duration of those steps. So we have uh, feasibility, from, sorry, from left feasibility to development to pre-construction and construction operations and decommissioning. And um, you'll probably notice there in that, in that second column, this is really all about getting permits to build your project. Uh, it's, um, it it can, can be time intensive. And you can see there for offshore wind, a time period of between five and 10 years to get all the permits you need lined up for a project in, in um, well, this is mainly for federal waters, but also it could be true for state waters. And you can compare that with the, the shorter time frames for some onshore wind projects and, and some of the solar, solar projects. You also see the construction timelines are also longer. These are more complex projects requiring usually a couple of seasons, a couple of years to get built um, in, those, in those summer seasons when the, when the, when the seas, are, uh, seas are calm. Um, a little bit more on just determining on, on the development, um, how development works and how you determine whether you have um, a site that that's that's going to that's going to really get get built eventually. So we 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 call this realize a framework where you look at the resource, which is really about how windy it is. You look at the environment, where you want to see what's happening at the site from an ecological perspective and uh, human environment and other sort of a traditional environmental assessment perspective. Authorizations, which is really about permits and leases and all the, uh, all the rights you would need to gather up to develop a project. Uh, land, well, there's often some uh, overlap there. It's really the, sort of the, in, in the case of Boehm, it's getting, that, it's getting that lease from the federal government, from the Department of the Interior to build at the site. Interconnection, obviously really very, very important. You have to, have to bring that cable from the offshore wind farm out in the ocean, bring it across, across shore and connect it into the, into, into the local grid, a very, very important pro part of the process, as is the S, the sales, the means of securing project income by, by the sale of energy and other support uh, mechanisms have to ensure that that revenue can come into the project to finance the project. And then also the, the engineering, um, which takes into account the site conditions, a bunch of studies that would go into determining the kinds of foundations you would build, uh, the size of those foundations, the nature of the materials, uh, and everything else. So just looking at the wind, I mean, the wind is, 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 is the big story for offshore wind. That shouldn't be, shouldn't, shouldn't be too, too surprising. That's going to that's gonna tell you all kinds of things about how much energy you're going to get out of the site, uh, how efficient the site is, 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 is going to be. Um, so this is, these are just a couple maps here. If you look at that map on the left, you can see this is actually a, a wind map at NREL. Uh, updates periodically the National Renewable Energy Lab, and you can see those very, um, those very on, on, on the east coast there, that, those purple zones, and then even further up in, in your neck of the woods, those very red zones, very, very windy areas um, up, in the, uh, up, up in New England, off, off the New, New England states, and that's why uh, some of these projects in, in New England are, uh, uh, are so um, attractive because the wind speeds are um, estimated to be uh, quite high. Um, and um, so the, the, you know, the, other, the other pieces of the wind resource, you need to really gather data at the site to really understand it, which is tricky because it's out in the ocean. Um, so I'll get to that in the next slide. You've got to take a little bit of data that you gather from the site and then make some sort of estimate um, at uh, the hub height, at the height of the, of the wind turbine. At, at the blade, at the top of the blade, at the hub, at the lower tip blade. So it's that's also a tricky business, and also determining uh, what that wind is going to look like um, over the life of the project—20, 20, 25 years, maybe even longer—if if a project is ever is ever uh, repowered. And the, and the third thing to think about is that there can be significant spatial variation across the site because 
um, these machines are pretty um, far apart. And there are reasons for that having to do with a thing called wake effects, because one turbine affects the, the, the ability of, a, of the turbine behind it to generate uh, electricity. And I'll get into that here in a second. So here, here, here's, what, here's what we do to understand the site better, to understand the very important, the, the, the wind quality um, uh, out there. And, you know, different countries and, and different states and different regions have approached this topic differently. Um, in some parts of the world, in Europe, there have been MET towers, meteorological towers that have been installed uh, uh, by state, by, uh, by countries. Um, uh, and you can see that there on the right, it's a, it's a, it's a MET tower. Well, an example of a Met tower that was that was put out in the I think it's in the Baltic Sea um, to, to see how it, what the quality of the wind is at, at very at very high levels above 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 the ocean. But we don't have um, really any we don't have that here in the United States. And so a, a technology has evolved over time called lidar, and it's called floating lidar, where you take um, a unit, a little floating measurement buoy, like you see there in that left image. And you bring it out to the site, and you um, shoot up light into the sky that measures the uh, velocity of the, of the um, aerosols that are flying across across the sky to determine uh, what the wind speed is like. So it's a very sophisticated technology. It's a relatively relatively um, affordable technology compared to the installation of that fixed large fixed platform that we see there um, on the right. You want to get it out onto the site. So you can hear you hear about that in the news with some of the sites that have been um, uh, that have been contracted um, uh, in New York um, and and in New England and in New Jersey. They have gone through a process of getting permits to bring out a flydar out to the site and anchor it and allow it to, to capture not only wind data but other environmental data off that platform. So we want you want to get it you want to get it in there uh, in, in the project area. You want to measure for at least a year. And you want to clean the wind data by, you know, identifying any problems with the equipment or the quality issues. And then, um, as I said, they're kind of those last four points there, just talking about the, the evolution of the collection of offshore uh, wind data over time. These are some of the um, uh, developments that, we, that we've seen over the past few decades. So there, there are a few losses when you get you get this great site with lots of lots of lots of great great wind. There are um, some losses that happen as you're as you're trying to bring, trying to convert that wind energy into electricity, and so those those happen. Some of those things happen out of the site, and I'll get get to that in the next slide. That's on the far left, left there. Um, this, these are kind of losses that are occurring within the wind farm, and then it's and then the rest of it is basically um, sort of electrical losses that happen because you've got an electric cable that's a subsea cable running from the project site. Um, to shore, and then you've got to bring that cable to the substation on shore. So there, there's some of those, some of those losses. So you're not going to get exactly the electricity that is produced at every um, individual uh, wind turbine generator (WTG). So this is a, this is an image that that really d displays this um, thing called wake effect. It's it's how the the wind flow behind a wind turbine is affected. Uh, by by the unit itself as it's generating electricity, so that's why you see some of these wind farms have uh, the the units being fairly far apart from each other because they want the wind the energy in the wind to regather and then and then strike that next turbine in the row and so that image there on the right, which has been shown a lot over over the years, just demonstrating how that wind flow behind each unit is um, is is disturbed. Uh, by the um, by 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 the turbine at the at, at the he at the head of the row. Um, so these are these are issues that 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 we deal with and that we understand more and more um, over over time, and it and it feeds into how um, offshore wind farms are designed um, and laid out in efficient ways that minimize wakes um, and that maximizes the energy that comes out of other facilities that are that are put out in the ocean. It's obviously a very very important topic. I'm just going to touch on just one other thing, 
and that is uh, how these projects uh, get 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 financed. Um, there's there's no way to really generalize about this, but it is uh, in general it is a, it is a it is a mix of equity and debt that goes goes into these projects. Um, there's the sponsor equity, uh, which is really really the de the developer um, in, in the in the project, and in in the U.S. As long as there's a, there are tax incentives in place, there's a there's equity that's uh, tax equity, and some of you might be might might be familiar with that. It's a, many developers don't actually have enough tax. Um, uh, they're not not large enough companies that they so they 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 provide equity uh, to larger uh, financial entities that use the tax credits um, on their on on their tax returns. That's the, those, that's how it breaks down between sponsor equity and tax equity. And then you've also got the debt. Um, but the key question is that the banks look at: Will the project produce revenue? And support repayment of the loan, and these are all the things uh, that they that they care about. They look very hard at before they make any any commitment to uh, provide debt on a project. Is it can, can you construct it? Can you operate it? Can you be, can it be operated safely? Uh, how does that energy yield look? Is that a reliable figure? And have we really kicked the tires on that? Is it is it is it um, have high availability? Will it, are these machines? Um, you know, up to snuff, and will they not, not 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 have much in the way of downtime because they are difficult to maintain um, if they if they if they do have failures to bring boats out there, um, and the weather's got to be good and all that. So, um, are the costs justified? Is the revenue solid? These are all the questions that go into the debt the debt financing of of offshore wind. So that's basically the, the, the my, my just a, my quick overview there for about fi about 15 minutes. I just want to show you some nice images here about just accessing these facilities once they're um, once they're up up and running with these crew transfer vessels that that can go out to the site. Uh, of course, the the facilities that will that would go in the Gulf of Maine will almost surely be floating facilities, so that it'll be it'll, it'll look a little a little bit different from what you're seeing here. But you have CTVs, you have uh, SOVs, which kind of dock up next to them if there's um, a service that needs to be done on a, on, on a unit, and they can go out on the gangplank and go up into the machine and correct what's, whatever's going wrong there. Some have helicopter access. You see it there in the, in, in, in the, in the lower, light, uh, lower left. And sometimes there are offshore accommodation facilities, offshore hotels, um, for, especially for some of these products that are, that are deep, deep into the sea, and it takes quite a while to get, to get out to the site. Can make economic sense to actually have an offshore accommodation um, out there, out there in the ocean by the project site. So that's uh, that's that's the overview, and that's um, I'll turn it back over, turn it back over to Senator Waters and, and Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Doug. That a really really helpful presentation. And um, Michael, I think because presenters may have to leave, why don't we have a few minutes for questions now to Doug? If that would be all right, and Alan, perhaps you can help identify folks who might have a hand up or otherwise indicated they would like to speak. I will do my best. If you have a question, please raise your hand using the raise hand function. If you are on the phone, I believe that it is star nine. Uh, well, Jim has a hand raised up there, Jim Chatone. Yeah, on, on one of your slides, Doug, you listed that the was a potential of 335 or 336 gigawatts. Now, is that for that the optimal output for these um, wind turbines, meaning that they have perfect wind conditions, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? That th that figure is the maximum output. It's what's called the nameplate capacity of each of the wind turbines all summed together. That's the maximum output on, 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 on the machine. It's called the nameplate capacity. Okay, so that means perfect wind conditions, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that operation means, that, all at the same time as well. That means, that means the maximum output. If they were all to, uh, to generate maximum output at any given time and without the, some of those losses I talked about, that's what you would see. Okay. Diane Foster. 
I, I, a clarifying question to the previous one, Doug. Um, is that the integrated estimate throughout the year? So I can appreciate it doesn't include losses at a particular time or to get at Jim's question, is that just the one day, are you referring to just the one day a year you have those conditions? Yeah, it, it, I'm sorry. It, it, the, the, the really, really, the the, the the right way to do this is 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 about energy. It, it's a bit, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a shorthand. What we really want to do is talk about energy output in terms of kilowatt hours or megawatt hours, and that's the way you really compare um, and really, really kind of get down, get get down, get down to brass tacks is energy output. This is just a shorthand to tell you because every site is different, and um, and it's you're not able to um, sum up these 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 output out, outputs across wind farms, but you do know what their what their nameplate value is. So it's just a it's just a convenient way, a bit of a shorthand way to describe these wind farms. Uh, but it, the, the downside is that it doesn't tell you exactly what the energy or what the average output actually is onto the grid from uh, from the wind farm. It's it, it's sort of like any any other kind of power facility, will you say? Where we're gonna we're gonna build this, and this is um, this is the main plan on it. This is this is the maximum it can it can produce. But then um, you know that's not exactly what is um, being being um, being uh, delivered to the grid. So uh, just to just to confirm, uh, I I can imagine that many of the listeners here would be interested in determining what the annual. Um, available resource we'd have, not just a, a specific day or two when you have peak wind conditions. But my actual question was regarding, it, it's my impression that the one of the available sites in the New Hampshire region is just offshore of Shoals Island, which you see the little bird behind me, and that um, the water depth there is between 50 and 100 meters. Can you talk a bit about the difference between floating and fixed platforms and what the sort of current state of knowledge and technology is for these intermediate water depths? Mm. If I just interject, Doug, so you'll know, is that we are likely to have a full presentation on this uh, later on in our, not, not today, but in our discussions, but please go ahead. But we, we're gonna certainly be looking at this, Diane, and getting reports on it. Yeah, so it's it's it, it's um it's it's evolving. I mean, uh, in the in the early days of offshore wind, uh, they, it was it was only these these fixed platforms in these relatively shallow waters. Um, and the, the kind of water depth you're talking about, we're really starting to get into um, more floating technology. Um, uh, you know, I it sounds like you're going to have a really detailed presentation on 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 floating floating offshore wind, but that's really what you start to get into once you get out of sort of 50, 60 meters um, and what you, you would use a jacket foundation mainly for waters of that depth. And then sort of beyond that, uh, you're going to start getting into floating, floating technology. But I, I, look, if, you, if, you, if you have engineering experts who are coming in, I don't want to, I don't want to preempt what they're, um, what they're going to, uh, the information they'll provide to you. I got another question. Uh, if, if that's we have um, reps, um, so Tony Ginto also who have questions following you, Jim. We have time for too many more, so go ahead. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on on the uh, question about the uh, actual output of these these turbines, um, just for a measure uh, a measurement of standard. Uh, Seabrook is 2,000 megawatts of capacity, so, um, and one of these turbines currently, uh, the, the, the largest ones right now, are about 12 megawatts. So uh, the the issue of how much of that energy is capturable has to do with the capacity factor. So I wanted to ask Doug. My understanding is that most of the offshore wind turbines can produce at about 70% of their capacity. Is that a, is that a normal number? Well, the, the capacity factor depends on, 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 a, on a number of things. Uh, it really, but mainly it's about how strong, how strong that, that wind is to determine how much, what percentage of that, of that nameplate capacity you're, 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 you're going to capture. 
the net capacity factor, that's, that's the, that really is the amount of energy that's delivered to the grid, including those losses that I talked about, is really somewhere um, between 30 and 50% of the, of the, of the nameplate uh, for, uh, for offshore wind. The technology is changing. It's very, uh, it's very, it's very site dependent, but that's, that's where we are. I mean, just, just I'm sorry, just, just to give you a, a, a little bit more uh, sort of real world, world context on this, um, you know, some of the projects that have been already been contracted in New England and, and, and other areas are really hundreds of megawatts and maybe even um, more than more than half a gigawatt is contracted. And that's re- really hundreds of thousands of households, um, you know, would be supplied energy um, from 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 these from these these wind farms. So but, you know, you, you just you just don't know how much energy is going to go onto the grid until you do these these these, these kinds of studies and you determine um, how big your facility is and how you're going to engineer it and uh, and all and all these things. All right, and then we have Tony Ginta with a question, hand raised. Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask the question, Doug. Obviously, the key reason for doing this is to slow down climate change to make a difference. I've been on a number of webinars over the last several weeks that say we're on the precipice here. So one of your most discouraging slides to me is the amount of time it takes to permit these wind power generators. You're talking five to 10 years. At best, I'm retired. At worst, I'm dead by the time some of these things go online. So is this typical in other countries? Is that permitting time five to 10 years? And if not, what can we do to speed it up? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a, really, that's a really good question. I, I can't really speak to uh, how it compares with other countries, but there is a, um, there is, um, there is a bit of a, t- a long time frame associated with these because of the number of years of, of pre-construction studies, and um, so you have to spend, you know, a year, two, three years collecting uh, site data to really understand the site, understand what the ecological resources out at the site. You've got to write, you've got to write your construction operations report, which, which goes to the federal government, and then they got to spend time analyzing it and making sure it all looks right. And so when you add it all up, you know, it's maybe maybe five years, maybe longer. I would say. Um, you know, some of the early projects are going to be be longer than that because they're the the they're they're the they're the first ones. So there's a bit of a first mover disadvantage. But I think that over time, I think especially as projects in sort of uh, in, in the same neighborhood, if you will, uh, uh, put in put in for their permits, it will it will become easier as the ecological resources within those neighborhoods uh, become uh, better understood. Thank you. Folks, we're going to have to move on to the next presentation. Jim, I know you have your hand up. We'll have time at the end, but um, we have four presentations to get through, and that's just what we're going to have to do. So, uh, Michael, we could have our next next one. And thank you so much, Doug. Thank you. Yeah, thank You're you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, next up, um, the steering committee was very uh, aware of the importance of the fisheries and the need to address that. And so we, we reached out to uh, Annie Hawkins from Rhoda to uh, to thankfully be available to give us a presentation to um, talk a bit about that for now again as, as the chairman said this will be a topic that we do address in the future heavily as well and um, and we'll get more into detail at that point but uh, I'd like to welcome Manny Hawkins uh, and uh, thank her for being here today. Great thank you good afternoon everybody um, you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes, great. Okay, thank you. I'm still not used to Zoom, but maybe in a few more years. Hopefully not. Um, anyway, um, thank you so much for inviting me. I will try to share my screen so I can project some slides. Um, see if I can get this. Again, not, not my forte. Um, so, second. Nope. Oh, boy. All right. Is it? Yep, the presentation now? Yes. Great. Okay, let's go to the beginning. Nope, 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 nope. Um, okay, so I can start by introducing myself while I try to get this queued up. So my name is Annie Hawkins, and I'm the executive director of RODA, which is the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance. And um, we formed about two years ago. We're a fishing industry trade association 
I'm with members all across the country now, East Coast and West Coast. Uh, we started in uh, from Maine and North Carolina on the East Coast and, and recently grew to the West Coast as well. Um, working a lot on, on offshore wind issues um, and, and other issues essentially, we're a strength in numbers fishing association that works on things that are of mutual interest to fishermen. Um, and I will say, I got it to work, okay. Um, that, you know, I appreciate this invitation. We had a big workshop last week and so I didn't have time to put together a really detailed PowerPoint, but we'll certainly reserve some time for Q and A because I find that on introductions to these issues, there's certainly a whole lot of questions. Um, fisheries is a really, really big topic. It's a really broad topic. Um, and so it's, it's always hard to know a little bit how to, how to winnow down the key issues. Of, of which there are a lot. Um, the good news is that there's becoming more and more issues. The bad news is that that means there's conflicts and concern, but the good news is that when we're talking about offshore wind now, we really are um, paying a lot more attention to the fisheries conflicts, getting down to a more um, granular level and really looking at them in more earnest. And so um, if I give a presentation like this two years ago, it would be very hard to, um, you know, get into detail on any of these issues because it was so new. Now we have the opposite problem, right? Where it's really hard to, um, to consolidate it, but here we go. So um, a little bit about Rhoda for, uh, there's a lot of folks on the line that I'm not familiar with, uh, some that I am. So hopefully nothing too repetitive, but um, we, our goal is to coordinate science and policy approaches, uh, approaches to managing development of the outer continental shelf um, to minimize conflicts with existing traditional historical fishing. So we're a really broad membership-based organization. We have everything from individual lobster vessels that are members all the way up to some of the biggest vertically integrated um, fishing processors and, and um, dealers in the country. Um, like I said, strength in numbers. Um, there's hasn't historically been a lot of cohesion within the fishing industry nationally and because it is such a diverse group of businesses and group of people and, um, but what we do find is especially now, there are a lot of topics that are of mutual interest. A lot of things that are not where people still uh, have their own opinions, but here we are. So we formed Rota two years ago. We signed a memorandum of understanding about a year and a half ago with the National Marine Fisheries Service and with BOM to improve science and communications between um, fishing industry related to offshore wind development. Prior to that time, there was a very strong sentiment that um, fishermen really weren't involved in offshore wind planning, um, that the two uses are really approached, permitted and analyzed on very parallel tracks um, when it's really one ocean and there's a lot of spatial overlap and these really need to be better integrated. We need to have fishermen at the table as well as fishery scientists and managers early and often so that we're making decisions that really maximize um, the compatibility of the two uses and also the sustainability of the two uses. So and Rhoda does some research, I'll, I'll get to more research stuff later in the presentation. And we've got a couple active projects right now. Relevant to the Gulf of Maine specifically, um, like I said, pretty diverse membership base. We've got a lot of associations that are members, including the New Hampshire Commercial Fishermen's Association, um, Mass and Maine Lobstermen's Associations, a couple of the ground fish sectors in Massachusetts, um, Northeast Seafood Coalition, some of the bigger businesses like O'Hara and Lunds. Um, and vessels that are fishing in the Gulf of Maine from as far south as New Jersey. And I think that's a pretty key point um, is that we tend to think, uh, or especially um, folks involved in offshore wind or that are not intimately familiar with fisheries tend to think that um, fishermen from their state are fishing in the federal waters off of their state. That is very often not the case um, where people are coming from all over regionally because they are federally permitted fisheries. And so it is pretty important to look at not only what other, what folks from other states are fishing off of your coast, but also where your state fishermen may be fishing off other states' coasts and making sure that they're being considered um, as other states continue with <laughs> development. So there is a lot of fishery engagement activities going on and there have been for a while. Um, almost every state has their own working groups of all different, um, all different varieties. And um, a lot of federal processes of BOM has their, their inner agency task forces, um, as well as listening sessions with fishermen. You have the Federal Fishery Management Councils, National Marine Fisheries Service and the commission um, engaging fishermen, talking to them, engaging these processes, the regional planning bodies, um, the developers are doing their own fisheries outreach as well as a lot of academic outreach. 
um, it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot, a lot for fishermen to be involved and to track. Um, and so what we've been seeing a lot is that they're asked for a lot of their time. Um, they're asked to give a lot of input, which is better than not being asked for input, but it's not always clear what's happening with that input. Um, and really with all of these projects and all of these different regions and the fact that um, many fisheries are federally permitted and even state fisheries can, can travel, right? Um, that people are pretty overwhelmed. And so rather than having one really clear, uh, well-integrated cohesive approach, people are being pulled in a million directions. And that's really kind of why we formed RODA so that we can help aggregate, prioritize that information, make sure that fishermen are spending as much of their time as they can on the water and running their own businesses, but that they're not left out because they're not attending all of these wind meetings, right? Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's getting better. We're, we're not, we certainly haven't uh, totally changed the game yet, but we do see things changing um, quite a bit to that end. So more specific to the Gulf of Maine. So floating projects are really considered no fish areas by fishermen. Um, and we know that this is true also in the project of Scotland um, because of these um, anchors and cables really you know, mobile gear clearly is not going to be able to tow through somewhere where there's a cable and even with fixed gear, um, the spatial conflicts are, are enough that, that folks feel that these are no fish areas. And so in a way that's, that's a big challenge, right? Um, in a way, it's, it's, it's not in terms of planning because there, there's a sense in which it's easier to, to pick an area. I don't want to say it's easy, it's not easy. Um, but if you look at an area as a fisheries closure, um, really it means sighting is the most important thing. And so finding areas with the least amount of fisheries conflict and with the least amount of environmental interactions that you're gonna have with sensitive habitat or to spawning populations, um, the real importance of this work and this coordination with floating wind is upfront. It's in this sighting phase, it's where we are now, right? So a general overview of major fisheries occurring in the Gulf of Maine, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, probably shouldn't be too surprising to most folks on this meeting, but you, you know, lobster, ground fish, herring, uh, mixed trawl, scallop fishery, which is mostly a little further south, monkfish, whiting, Jonah crab, and shrimp fishery, which is currently under moratorium. And this information in these slides um, actually was prioritized by a very, very broad group of fishermen. This is some of the same information that I presented to BOMS Gulf of Maine Task Force meeting last um, December. Um, in Durham, I believe. Uh, so this, this is, you know, what, what they're prioritizing is, is happening in the area and to share. Um, the gear types used are primarily uh, pots, trawl, persane, paired trawl, dredge and gillnet. These obviously all have very different operations, different footprints, um, different needs, operate in different places in the water column, but most of them, all of them not compatible with floating projects just because of the way they operate. Uh, there is no area in the Gulf of Maine that doesn't have fishing. So that's, that's a question I get asked a lot. Where can we put these things where there's no fishing? Wish there was an easy answer to that question, but there's not. Um, but fishing does vary greatly by location. And so what you find is some areas obviously have higher relative importance to some fisheries and other to others. And the devil's really in the details in looking at where you're considering citing who's gonna be impacted, whether that's a diffuse impact amongst a lot of people in a fishery that may otherwise be economically healthy, whether that may have a differential impact to a certain port or certain gear type or, or one business or one person in some cases. And uh, this information can be really, really hard to tease out, but not impossible. So that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do it. Um, and then each fishery has its own priority areas. And I won't go through these in detail because this is really um, an introduction, but, but know that there's different kinds of spawning grounds and super important grounds for different fisheries. And when you're looking at fisheries data, you may not necessarily see those because they may be seasonal closures and you may be looking at annual data, right? Or, you know, there's a whole, or there may be regulatory reasons that those fisheries were closed for certain years. You may look at the wrong years of data and not have these things light up. Um, and so there's a lot of different um, considerations that are really specific to all these different fisheries. The single best source of information um, about how to understand what's going on on the water in these places is fishermen, of course, um, certainly, there's also fisheries managers in, in the states and, and federal government that can assist with this. But in a lot of cases, um, this information is confidential. If, it's, if there's not enough 
folks fishing in a given area during the time period that you're looking at. And so it can be really difficult to find. Um, so feedback from fishermen is, I think I just went over all of this, um, that they really want to be able to provide coordinated feedback. Um, there is certainly a tiering issue here where you have these sort of big scale federal regional level things going on. And then once you really get into that site selection and individual projects that have um, certainly more impact on, on certain communities um, and certain people, then that direct engagement becomes a lot more important. Um, but there's so much of this that needs to be done up front for that. Um, and state and federal permit holders are different, operate very differently, particularly in Gulf of Maine, particularly when you're looking at the lobster fishery versus something like the ground fish fishery. They're just, they're managed different. The data sets are different. Um, and fishermen have, have learned from other regions and, and have strongly requested that the Coast Guard conduct a port access route study to determine navigational safety needs prior to wind energy areas being designated in the Gulf of Maine. Um, we saw that process flip the other way around in Southern New England and it did not um, you know, created quite a bit of conflict, still creating quite a bit of conflict. Um, so I'll close out here. Um, a few thoughts on science and research. There have been a lot of developments. Things are developing very quickly on the science and research side. Um, we did last year come together uh, with a group of fishing industry leaders and offshore wind developers and formed the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, or ROSA. ROSA is a regional coordination body for um, for uh, research and science related to offshore wind and fisheries interactions. It is not part of RODA. It is an independent organization. It's a 501c3 with its own executive director. Um, she's great and I highly recommend if, if you're interested in the science stuff, inviting her in um, to, to present to your group. I'm on the board of that organization. The board is 50% folks with the fishing industry and 50% offshore wind developers. Um, but it, incorporates a bigger council that includes states, um, the federal agencies, the fishery management councils and, and other folks. Uh, we're right now in the middle of a big project through our MOU with NIMS and Balm, doing a synthesis of the science um, for fisheries and offshore wind interactions that consisted of a three-day workshop. The first two days were last week, Thursday and Friday. We have one more day on October 30th and then a report that we'll be drafting with the agencies through the winter that really provides um, is the status of our understanding, existing data gaps, and research recommendations for fisheries and offshore wind. That's a big, big effort involving a lot of people. Um, and then there's obviously topic specific projects. Um, but the one thing I think that's really key here for science and research to note is that there are huge, huge challenges with spatial representation of the Gulf of Maine fisheries. You've got a lot of fisheries operating in the region that don't have ready to go plug and play spatial data. Um, and so in looking at that and how, you know, given that you have this situation where the siting is so important because of the nature and the technology of floating offshore wind, and you have these fisheries that don't have anything ready to go to show you necessarily where they're operating um, the same way that, that you might in a, in a really data rich fishery, um, that means that the time really is now uh, to start looking at that data, to start working with where people are fishing, um, start identifying the major actors and the major groups. If this is aligned with wind energy leasing timelines and decision points, um, it can be done. Um, but what we see often is that when we're close to construction, we start looking at these things and this type of research for this information where that, that spatial data is not available takes a long time and it takes a lot of resources. Um, because at this point, the only way to really get that information is from fishermen themselves. Um, and there are plenty of researchers and plenty of ways to do that, but uh, nobody, nobody started. And to do it on this spatial scale and looking at the specific things that you would need to know, I would just highly urge that to be prioritized and be prioritized in a way that's driven by the fishing industry and fishermen and has them just really, really completely involved from day one as, as partners, as planning partners, not you know, here's a construction plan, can you react to it? Because we really haven't found that to be effective. So I will leave it there. Um, stop sharing my screen. And again, thanks for the invitation and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Annie. That was really helpful. And just the kind of presentation I, the steering committee felt we ought to have really early on because of the commitment we made in the legislation to uh, include the fishermen from the very get-go here. 
And just a reminder to the commission members that part of our legislative, legislatively described uh, duties uh, is to be advisory to the BOEM Gulf of Maine Task Force. And so I think that recommendations that we make in, re in relationship to this area of fisheries are gonna have some weight and it's gonna be something important for us to do. Uh, we just have a couple minutes for some questions. So Alan, if you have some uh, hands raised, that would be great. Yes, uh, if anybody has questions for Aaron, please raise your hand via Zoom or if you're on the phone, press star nine. And I see Diane Martin has a hand raised physically and I saw that, so go for it, Diane. Here, hold on, you're still muted, Diane. There you okay. go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. I wanted to say thank you to the chair for setting these up. I think they're incredibly helpful. And I'm wondering if the presenters would be willing to share their slides um, so that we could have access to those after. I believe it's our intention to have all presentations um, available on the website that will be developed for uh, the commission. So if they're willing to provide, we're gonna have them available. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Well, Annie, thank you again. I have a feeling we're going to have you back, and I have a feeling that we're going to want to hear more about the research because we certainly can make some recommendations uh, in that regard as well. So th thank you again, and I'm sure we'll be seeing you soon. And Michael, you want to tee up the next one, please? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you again, Annie. And um, the next perspective we wanted to try and infuse uh, early on here um, is some information about economic benefits and impacts. Uh, there's a recent report by a firm named Wood McKenzie, and so we uh, thankfully were able to connect with them. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dan Shreve, who is the head of global wind energy research for Wood McKenzie, as well as his colleague Aaron Barr, uh, who is one of the authors, one of the uh, main authors of that recent study called Economic uh, Impact. Uh, uh, there you go. Economic impact study of new offshore wind lease auctions by BOEM and uh, did specifically have a section noting the Gulf of Maine. And so I'd like to welcome uh, Dan and Aaron uh, to uh, present their presentation. All right. Thanks very much, Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you, Senator. And thank you for the commission for having us today. It's a pleasure to speak with you. So just as a corollary to Michael's remarks. Um, a quick word about our firm. Uh, Wood McKenzie, for the folks that don't know, we are a global market advisory and consulting firm. Our group is specifically within Wood McKenzie, focused on the power and renewable sector. We have about, hopefully this is a slide's a little bit dated, and actually after a few acquisitions, we have over 140 analysts working within the power sector currently. Uh, my firm, formerly May Consulting, was acquired in 2017 as well as the Green Tech Media folks in 2016. The group has grown by leaps and bounds, and we do an enormous amount of work within the renewable sector covering solar, storage, onshore wind, offshore wind, EVs, et cetera. So the entire, the entire gambit of renewables uh, and technologies that'll be defining the energy transition. So specific to this discussion, the offshore wind space, just as a means of a quick summary of the report that was referenced by Michael, um, where do we see the opportunity for offshore wind moving forward here in the United States? There's about a 37 gigawatt pipeline that we see in development with an opportunity to provide over $2 billion to the US Treasury just in the form of offshore wind leases. Um, that's inclusive of about 2 million acres of federal waters. Um, look at it throughout New York, California, and North and South Carolina. Um, it could support upwards of 28 gigawatts of offshore wind development. Other auctions, as was mentioned, there are some opportunities that we see that exist within the Gulf of Maine, as well as some other areas in California uh, that also could be providing some additional economic impetus moving forward. Um, this, however, of course, is gonna be predicated a lot on some of the technology discussion that was uh, discussed earlier with respect to floating wind. The opportunities to drive approximately 160 billion kilowatt hours per year. So there's a discussion about megawatts versus megawatt hours, capacity factors, what have you. Offshore wind, one of the key benefits of offshore wind is its ability to produce substantial portions of renewable energy uh, in these large power blocks. It's a lot different than what you would see from a solar um, facility that tends to be anywhere 20 to 100 megawatts at most. 
um, where you see onshore facilities, some larger ones, obviously Texas, Oklahoma, through the wind belt of the central core of the US. Uh, but here we start talking about Massachusetts, we talk about New Hampshire, Maine, what have you, um, areas where there's higher levels of population density, less land availability. Uh, offshore wind becomes a critical resource to achieving the renewable energy targets that are being set forth by state, legis state legislatures. Also in the minds of uh, state legislatures, the ability to execute economic revitalization projects and the ability to do this um, has been well recognized. And we've seen an enormous amount of activity over the past two years in terms of the deployment of offshore wind leases and as well as a number of RFPs that are going to drive a substantial um, forecast for the US wind, uh, offshore wind market here through the next uh, 10 years. We're looking at around 80,000 jobs annually based on the research that was provided before. Um, and through a diversity of different industries, we talk about transportation, access, production, facilities for these very large strategic components, um, operations and maintenance facilities, repair facilities, what have you. So the total investment is going to be substantial of about 17 billion by 2025, over 100 by 2030, 166 by 2035. So an enormous amount of opportunity that does exist and this is predicated on what we see as being for all intents and purposes our base case. And we'll get into that next. So looking at where the opportunity lies. On the lower left-hand side, you can see the states that are represented within this forecast. Our business is providing these market forecasts to the biggest players within the marketplace. So the turbine vendors, the financiers, the banks, the developers that are executing these projects, we speak to all of them on a very regular basis. And this is the forecast that we are providing to them. So you can see that we are experiencing a very substantial jump in the 2024 time period. If you look at this forecast about a year ago, this was a little bit different. We had a little bit more of a gradual increase that was beginning in the 2022 timeframe. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management um, delayed the launch, so to speak, of this industry by uh, calling, for an uh, calling for a cumulative environmental impact study to be performed before the Vineyard Wind Project was allowed to move forward. Maine anywhere. Um, and the Maine is a very small portion there for whoever's asking. We'll talk about that in a moment. But um, as we see, this is through 2029. We're looking at about a four gigawatt per year marketplace. This is a massive departure from what we've seen in the United States over the past 10 years. The market has been dominated by the onshore market. Um, we're looking at over 16 gigawatts to be installed onshore this year in 2020, well over 11 gigawatts next year in 2021 as the production tax credit ramps down. That's a key federal policy that's driven onshore wind. The investment tax credit is a key policy that is going to help drive offshore wind. There are some concerns about how long we have to wait uh, for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management um, to provide its final decision, record decision, I should, I'm sorry, final decision that is due this December that should allow Vineyard to move forward. And that's what we see allocated here in 2023 time horizon. So the market absolutely looks extraordinarily robust. Um, and this is driven entirely from state level actions. And I wanna make sure that that's key. We do not have a federal mandate at this point in time. Things could change substantially here in the next few weeks, but at this point in time, this is all state driven. So we talk about those states, where do we stand? The Eastern seaboard is the central um, focus for the offshore market at this point in time, why? As I mentioned before, there's a lot of uh, very progressive states that have renewable energy targets that they wish to meet in order to meet them as fast as they can in the most efficient means possible, uh, they're taking advantage of technology advancements that have occurred in the offshore sector uh, and deploying them up and down the eastern seaboard. So this was a bit of a domino effect. Uh, we looked at what happened a couple of years ago when Massachusetts started kicking this around in New York as well. Uh, a number of other states followed suit when they saw the success that was um, uh, happening in these early movers. And you can see the, the blocks on the next to each individual state basically characterizing where things have improved, where are the market signals strongest in the clockwise from top left, we have policy frameworks, available lease areas, what have you. So if we're talking about Maine, it's been a little bit of a tough slog right now. And a lot of that has to do with the fact it has more challenging site conditions 
than many of the other states. Deep water installations require floating foundation technology. Floating foundation technology is advancing rapidly. However, it is not monopile bottom fixed foundations or nor does it have jackets that have been mainstreamed to most um, you know, for, for all intents and purposes within the European Union and even in China at this point in time. Floating is still very much a uh, technology that remains in its infancy. Um, furthermore, if you look at what have the goals versus uh, mandates been, the, goal, the, the states that have the mandates are attracting the most attention. They have substantial pipelines that they are bringing to bear and they're only getting larger. RFPs have been solicited for most of these major um, uh, state level initiatives. So, and that's the basis of the forecast that we showed before. But in general, uh, you can see where some of the states are in terms of this engagement. Uh, Massachusetts around 1.6 gigawatts, uh, contracted at this point in time, 3.2 gigawatts, expected to be built by 2035. New York, 1.8 or nine by 2035. New Jersey, over seven gigawatts. And these are massive markets, massive power pools. And it's to be expected that they're gonna have a larger level of engagement within the offshore sector. Smaller markets such as Maryland, Rhode Island, what have you, Connecticut even for that matter, have been able to piggyback on some of these larger RFPs uh, to be able to participate as well. West Coast, very much in the same type of situation as they are in the Gulf of Maine. Deep water installations, there's certainly some challenges that exist here from low cost renewable resources that exist elsewhere. So for instance, if we're talking about state of Washington, certainly there's a hydro resource there that's exceptional, that's gonna be low cost. Um, and if you're looking at California, it has some extraordinarily aggressive renewable mandates, um, not nothing, nothing specific to offshore wind at this point, um, but certainly they have their own set of challenges if we look at the, um, uh, the site conditions in terms of the deep water installations, but also challenges with respect to the Navy, uh, shipping coming in and out of the various ports uh, in California, as well as the traditional issues that we see with fisheries and other uh, uh, marine use uh, industries. So what's ahead? What's, what are some new areas that we see coming up? Gulf of Maine has a possibility here of around five gigawatts based upon um, our rough estimates of what we're expecting for turbine power density within these lease areas. California is expected at around nine gigawatts. North Carolina moving forward with five and a half gigs. South Carolina, six gigs. We're seeing some uh, additional interest, of course, too, in the New York fight as well. So a lot of that additional activity that's moving along uh, in terms of offshore wind lease series. And that's really, that's the foundational elements. That's what's really helping drive the industry to have that Bureau of Ocean Energy Management activity paving the way for these um, facilities to be built. <clears throat> so where could it go? We are looking at a 24 gigawatt installation through 29. This actually got bumped up a little bit. This slide's a little dated. Um, our latest Q3 market outlook update, we update these quarterly. Uh, is looking at something closer to around 25 gigawatts. Um, the bull case, we're talking about uh, upside expansion towards markets on the West Coast and other uh, states. We can get upwards around 32 gigawatts potentially. Uh, downside more towards 17 gigawatts. There's a variety of different things that are gonna drive this forecast in terms of the upside downside. We'll get into those at this moment, but they're the ones that you typically expect. The availability of transmission, local opposition, tariffs, unfavorable federal policy, favorable federal policy, expansion of state mandates, et cetera, et cetera. So we talk about these auctions, we say how attractive the market is. Um, if you look at the past forecast of where we were a few short years ago and how cheaply these um, offshore wind leases were being purchased for and where we're expecting to go here in the future, California, Maine, Carolinas, um, <clears throat> there's a substantial substantial increase in the purchase price. And this underlines the amount of interest in the global market in the US. This is absolutely unequivocally the most attractive emerging market for the offshore wind space. So when you're looking at companies like Avangrid, SIP, Orsted, um, others that are looking to jump into this market, they're doing so for a reason. This is an extraordinarily attractive market and they're willing to pay the price to play. 
So what is the opportunity for this accelerated leasing program? We're talking around $166 billion in offshore wind investment. Um, you see the call areas that are outlined here and what the relative capacities are, uh, the economic impact assumed, the assumptions here in terms of the capacity and the wind jobs per year. Uh, total capital invested is obviously proportional to uh, the amount of uh, gigawatts that are being installed. You know, typically speaking, we're seeing anything from say 4 million uh, in the early stages, 4 to 5 million per megawatt being the overnight capital cost for these types of installations, that'll drop over time. But for the initial installs, it's certainly gonna be the case. The three companies I mentioned those, uh, Mr. Feister, I think had mentioned some of these as well, uh, talking about who the players are and who's engaged um, and what the extent of the 28 gigawatt pipeline is being maintained by a, quite frankly, a very small group of people. Um, so with respect to these companies, uh, getting their engagement early if there is discussions in terms of you know how can the state of new hampshire benefit economically through some type of investment um it's key to look at these larger players these are the companies that are going to essentially drive the market and then getting their input early is going to be critical to ensuring a successful um, uh, set of activities associated with offshore wind development in new hampshire so once this is the last slide, we talk about our discussion points around the angel jobs reported. If there's any specific questions on this, Aaron, who is on the phone with me right now, is one of the co-authors of this report. Um, it talks about the annual jobs supported by each phase of activity. Uh, and you can see Maine and New Hampshire highlighted there on the right-hand side. The you know, majority of uh, jobs are always going to be within the construction phase. Once these projects are built, um, the operational costs are still fairly substantial, but certainly you talk about the billions of dollars that are at play here in terms of the just massive scale of these facilities, 800 megawatts, 1.2 gigawatt type facilities that are deploying 10, 12, 14, 15 megawatt machines that are flying rotors that are over 200 meters in diameter. Um, it's really awe-inspiring when you look at the, what needs to happen in order to make this work installation vessels, crew transfer vessels, helicopters, as mentioned previously, all absolutely in play. Um, so a lot of interesting things, a very interesting part of the market to be engaged in. Okay, with that, any questions that might be from the audience? Well, thank you so much, Dan and Aaron, uh, for this presentation. I, I saw a different version of it a few weeks ago, and this is why I thought it'd be so important to have you uh, here and um, you know my my sense that yes our own project in the Gulf of Maine may be quite a few years out but the potential for participation in this industry um, because of facilities that we have now and the supply chain capacity that we have now for the industry that's developing uh, in southern New England is really really great um, so we do have time for just a, a few questions so Alan if you've got some hands up that would be great looking for hands uh Again, guys, if you want to raise your hand via Zoom, and if you're on the phone, it is star nine. And I will look around for physical hands being raised. Jim Toton has a question. On, uh, Dan, on, on your slides, you had posted all these uh, potential uh, jobs uh, associated with the manufacturing and as, with, with, as well as the supply chain. What percentage of these jobs would be um, foreign as compared to domestic? Um, local content's gonna vary significantly by component. So in the early stages, when we start talking about, say for instance, Vineyard in Massachusetts, there require, there's always gonna be requirement from the supply chain uh, companies, you know, whether they're making towers, whether they're making blades, they want to understand the level of certainty associated with the market before they make some of these big ticket investments in any specific region. And certainly there's gonna be a lot of uh, discussion, there has been a lot of discussion regarding what gets put in what state. So there's been a lot of economic discussion with respect to port redevelopment for operations and maintenance, um, deployment, installation, staging, things along those lines. If you look at you know New Bedford and other areas, um, but really we haven't seen any concrete commitments yet from any of the major component manufacturers. So there's still a little bit of a wait and see. I, my expectation is you'll see more of that 
coming after the elections, they have a good idea of what federal backing will be for these state level mandates. Now, with all that said, the first set of projects is very likely to be fully supplied by the European Union facilities that are already in existence, whether this is the UK, Germany, um, France, uh, what have you. But that said, we were expecting, in light of the fact that you have upwards of a 30 gigawatt um, product, a pipeline that's going to be in existence through 2035, there absolutely unequivocally will be supply chain investment here in the United States. In order to, you know, one, to avoid some of the FX issues, but two, just the wasted money in terms of logistics, moving equipment across the Atlantic, very large equipment, I might say, from um, these production centers to the United States. So, Aaron, I think there were some, if you remember, I don't remember the exact percentage. Do you have any kind of ballpark in terms of what our forecasts were assuming with respect to local content for key components? Sure. Yeah, I can take that one. This is Aaron Barr from Wood McKenzie. Um, so I, actually all the graphics that we included in this presentation are U.S. based jobs. So there's a significant amount of outlook for local manufacturing and construction jobs. Um, as Dan said, they vary a lot by component, by turbine OEM, by state, where those parts are coming from. Uh, but given the size and scale of some of these components, and we're talking blades in excess of 150 meters and, you know, in, within the long term, um, you know, they really need to be manufactured here in the United States. Um, they get to the point where they can't even, they're too big to ship even across the ocean. So um, I think that will certainly be true for blades tower sections, transition pieces, foundations. And I think we're gonna see some more nacelle assembly um, migrate to the United States as well in the long term. Um, so, but you know, that's just the component manufacturing when it comes to installation um, of these, you know, turbines in the ocean, that takes a, it takes an army of technicians out there to install and commission these turbines. And that, uh, that activity will all be done with, with domestic labor. I, I think it'll get to the point um, where a lot of this labor will have to come from other parts of the US. So we may see uh, skilled craftsmen within the, the Gulf, um, the, 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 um, you know, down in the, in the oil producing states uh, that have a lot of offshore oil drilling and rigging experience that will actually be imported into the area. So I think there's there's a lot of economic development opportunity for local uh, labor as well as uh, bringing additional skilled labor in from outside the region. On another question. Uh, yes, we have Matt Mayo. Matt. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Dan, for the presentation as well. Um, one thing that I thought was notable was on slide six, you talk about uh, the potential for community choice aggregation to support offshore in California, mm -hmm. also a pathway that it would exist here in New Hampshire. And I was wondering if you could just give a, a 30 second primer on what that is and where you see that potentially going. Oh, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask. Well, I'll do my best. I know that there's one of those things I tend to be know enough to be dangerous. CCAs have, have popped up a lot in California, community choice, basically kind of almost like a co-op. Um, they've, they've actually, they've been very focused in California in terms of um, really trying to help facilitate the deployment of solar power. Um, smaller communities need, you know, in, in general, as their, their power needs are not so huge as say utility sized. So they're able to glom on to some of these um, smaller solar facilities, essentially take advantage of the very low cost of that solar energy that's being deployed by facilitation of a power purchase agreement. Um, now you can do the same type of thing here in the offshore space. Um, it really comes down to a couple of different things. One, the economics are gonna be different. Onshore wind is much cheaper than offshore wind. Um, solar power, in the onshore sense is going to also be cheaper than offshore wind. The problem always comes down to you, can you actually build enough of it in, in light of the land intensity that's involved and just in general, how does your resource look like versus the, the incredible wind resource that we have here uh, up in New England? So there's a few things at play. If you're able to get some corporates involved, that's something else that's in, in, you know, being discussed. 
a lot of corporate sponsored renewables, the Microsofts of the world, the Facebooks, data center intensive type companies, folks that have really intensive power needs are, 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 are basically inking these virtual PPAs to help support renewables development. So I would say activity on the CNI side, I would say that CCAs are definitely another opportunity. Um, if you're able to have enough folks that are able to cultivate enough demand that's willing to pay for that premium power type of subscription, quite frankly. So it's definitely an opportunity. Um, it's a unique one, it's niche. Um, so I'm not sure how exactly how widespread it's gonna be at this point in time. We're seeing most of the activity still happening via utility bus bar PPAs. Uh, th thank you. And um, I think we're gonna have to move on pretty quickly, but let me just throw one in here. Um, sure. It does seem that one of the messages from your presentation is those states with mandated uh, procurements um, seem to be a step ahead in the game? Yes. Okay, and thank you. And Alan, maybe we have one more one more question, if there is somebody. Let me see, anybody else looking for physically raised hands or digital ones? Doesn't well, we do have one from the public uh, asking, but none from the commission. All right, we'll wait for the public until the public comment session, okay? All right, thank you, Senator. Thank you to the commission. Thanks again, Dan and Aaron. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate having early on this kind of way to sketch things out. I'm sure Commissioner Caswell and a lot of uh, folks up here will be real interested <laughs> to bring the uh, business, business here. And uh, this is really a good start for us to think about it. So thank you again to both of you. And Michael, one more. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Dan and Aaron. And um, so finally, uh, the, the most patient of the group, um, the other angle that we had discussed in the steering committee had been to try and get a bit more closer sense of the industry itself and the businesses and the players involved um, in, in this last group, the uh, business, for, um, uh, business Network for Offshore Wind has been involved uh, for a long time in this industry and I think has some very unique perspective. So um, I'd like to introduce Liz Burdock, who is the executive director, as well as Ben Brown, who's the director of industry education, uh, to touch upon that. So with that, uh, Liz and Ben, welcome. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Senator Waters, for including the business network for Offshore Wind. I, like Annie, am a little challenged here with technology. So I will try to share my screen and hopefully um, it will all work out. Um, can you see that? Yep, it's up on our end. Okay, is it, let's see, how's that? Is that working? Yep. Okay, uh, perfect. Click your swap monitors, Liz, so that it goes into the... The other one? Thank you, Ben. Yep. Perfect. So, well, great. Ben spoke so you all can see his face and voice and know who our person is on the ground up there. Ben is actually in Maine, but he is our regional director for Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. So um, we are very pleased to have Ben on board with us. Uh, this picture is actually the first uh, offshore wind project in federal waters. It is the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project this summer. If you were Paying close attention to the offshore wind industry, you know we had a, another milestone in our our short history here in the United States with the installation of two, a two turbine project um, off the coast of Virginia uh, that was installed by Dominion Energy. And I'm proud to say that COVID-19 did not stop us or them in any way. And they went forward with no delays on budget on time. So we are absolutely COVID resilient in the offshore wind industry. And you'll see that and you've heard that specifically from all the presentations from Doug and from the Wood McKenzie presentation as well. Um, just a little bit about us, if you don't know who we are, we are a national nonprofit. Uh, we're solely focused on offshore wind. Um, that is our one major focus. We focus on building out the U.S. offshore wind market and its supply chain. We are not a trade association. We are a 501c3 educational nonprofit. And we meet our mission by education and connecting individuals. And over the last eight years, we have brought together 
more than 8,000 people representing over 18, 1,800 companies um, through 71 different events. We have over 304 members. Many of the develop, all of the developers actually that were spoken about today are members of the network, the turbine suppliers, uh, the major tier one contractors, and then a variety of companies uh, throughout the supply chain down to a very small one man ship repair companies um, are part of the business network for offshore wind. So we have a diverse view of offshore wind um, and are able to bring that perspective uh, to the conversation. I think it's important that you understand we don't view the offshore wind industry um, as you know, only the United States. We view ourselves as part of the global offshore wind market. I'm not gonna go over all of this because you've heard a lot of it already, but some of the things I wanna point out to you, which I think are just absolutely um, fascinating considering uh, what we've all been through over the last basically um, seven months is that in the first quarter of 2020, um, Offshore Wind received $335 billion in financial decisions. These financial decisions offset the, the losses that we actually saw in the solar and onshore wind industry. Uh, then IEA came out and said, there's enough global capacity of offshore wind to power every home and business 18 times over. Um, so that's, that is, you know, uh, unbelievable, but all of that global capacity really is if we get and when we get uh, commercial floating offshore wind going. Um, another thing is NRL just came out with their 2019 market report, which we will put in the chat and this commission should definitely look at that report and also have NRL come and speak to them about it, uh, speak to you about it. Um, there is You've heard there's 29, I mean, I'm sorry, 27 gigawatts of installed capacity. Um, there's 83 gigawatts that have received either permitting or financial close, and they are in the pipeline and will be installed by 2025. And our global pipeline right now is 232 gigawatts. Um, the country that's really on our heels, I guess we should, we should hear footsteps is China. China is really starting to embrace offshore wind. They had the most installed capacity of any country uh, during 2019. Um, then we have the future, which is floating offshore wind. I did wanna bring this to your attention. This grew to 82 megawatts in 2019 with the UK um, being the country that looks to install the most floating over the next, uh, over the next year. I, I do wanna say if you didn't see uh, Prime Minister Johnson's um, uh, announcement, he announced that, uh, there will, that the UK will, uh, will procure 40 gigawatts, I'm sorry, 60 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2040. And in 2021 alone, they will have a, a 12 gigawatt auction. So they are looking at scale, again, to bring manufacturing, to bring investment into the UK, and they're backing that up with training and with port investments. Let me move one. Again, um, Asia, uh, we always think that states are competing with one another when I think actually we're competing with other countries. And I'll explain this uh, a little bit later on, but I do want you to know Asia is the growing fastest growing market for offshore wind. Um, here in the US, I'm glad uh, our numbers match the numbers that you heard earlier. We track offshore wind every single day. We have our own database uh, where we um, share it with our members tracking all the latest developments. Uh, there is 9.1 gigawatts of present offtake. Uh, we will, we project that there will be 25 gigawatts installed by 2030 or under construction by 2030. Uh, we've been tracking the price points. If, if the lowest price point was in Massachusetts with the Mayflower wind price, this 5.8 cents levelized cost of energy makes us competitive globally um, on, on price. The other thing that I think is also really interesting is that we had a billion dollar invested just a month ago by BP into the Equinor project. For equity. So we have watched billions of dollars by major players uh, be invested into the U.S. offshore wind industry. Let me go for it. 
These are the bone lease sites. I won't spend much time. You've all seen this. You all know about the bone process, but and you just heard about it. But this gives you a sense of the bone map. We're a bi-coastal market now. Um, so we really are looking at the West Coast to develop. The state policy commitments reach almost 29 gigawatts of offshore wind. That's either a commitment with an offshore renewable energy credit or a power purchase agreement. So states have committed to procuring that amount of offshore wind. And whoops, go back. These are the, this is our offshore wind market. As you heard, it is in the Northeast um, from essentially from Virginia all the way up to Maine. Um, the green lease areas have received a financial mechanism. And then that leads us to the, oops, I'm gonna skip the slides, but that leads us to the 9.1 uh, gigawatts that is currently that are currently under development. And you can see uh, where, those, where those projects are and where they're in the pipeline. Um, this is our tracking of the East Coast ports and offshore wind. Um, all of these ports are either an activity has been decided. Uh, so for example, there is um, monopile manufacturing going into Paulsboro, uh, New Jersey. We know that. Um, they're looking at gravity-based uh, manufacturing for foundations up in New York. We have in Charleston, South Carolina, we now have a Nexus has converting their uh, high voltage cable facility into an offshore wind export uh, cable facility. Uh, so there, there are port activity that is being decided up and down the East Coast um, between from O&M ports all the way to manufacturing ports. Uh, you probably saw where New Jersey made a major investment into their uh, New Jersey wind port, uh, which they are looking to be an anchor of a manufacturing hub for the mid-Atlantic, at least if not for the East Coast. Um, if you haven't done a port assessment study, I, high re I highly recommend that that is something that the state look at doing. Uh, and then finally, floating offshore wind. Um, you all know about the $100 million investment that our RWE um, placed into the main Aqua Venice project. This is really significant because it does get you, um, you the U.S. into the offshore wind, floating offshore wind market. Um, I, I really want to say this, that the supply chain for floating is starting to essentially um, become identified globally. I, so if, you, you, if your businesses want to wait until there is a project off your coast, it's going to be too late. They need to start looking at, at this industry now. They need to look at it not just locally, but regionally and globally. Um, that is really important. There's about 55 different uh, floating platform technologies out there. There will be some winners and losers, and we think that it will get called down to maybe four or five. So really understanding the industry and understanding where the opportunities lie is really, really important for businesses. Um, this is the least areas uh, off of the the West Coast is, represents about 2,200 megawatts of potential offshore wind. Again, that market has not firmed up. So I just wanted to put this out there so you, you knew what uh, the West Coast was looking to do. Um, and again, the industry is on track to become a trillion dollar industry by 2040. Um, this is something else that we also do. So I had my team pull the, the local businesses in your area that have self-identified that they want to participate into the offshore wind industry. Um, New Hampshire actually only has 12 right now that, ha that has identified. So we pulled, we pulled the region so you could see. Uh, again, this is something that we track. We have a registry on our site for them to self-identify where they fit. Um, it's something that I think that you all, that it would be helpful for you all to let businesses know about so that we can partner them up with either local, regional, and global businesses. Um, it's important to localize the supply chain. We talked about the global um, explosion of offshore wind. There will not be enough businesses worldwide to um, install the amount of offshore wind that we are talking about. So between manufacturing, installation, operating and maintaining, we need more businesses. 
Um, and so it's really important that we localize the supply chain that helps us bring down costs that will help us obviously generate a lot of jobs that we've all heard about. So one of the things that we are doing is we are launching a training that will help businesses identify specifically where they fit into the supply chain. And it breaks down all the five phases of offshore wind from siting and permitting, manufacturing, construction and installation, um, operations and maintenance, and then how you can enter into the supply chain. And let me also say there are a ton of jobs in the siting and permitting phase of offshore wind where all of our projects are now. Uh, we've been tracking this and we know that over 320 some companies have already received contracts in the offshore wind industry. And this is really just from 2016 to right now to where we are. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Well, th thank you so much, Liz. Um, it really is so many important um, opportunities here and uh, some good caveats as well about um, getting in early on the floating and uh, finding a way so New Hampshire businesses can understand better, perhaps through the training that you offer, um, what is available out, out there. And uh, it just, you know, really, really helpful and uh, good to have this as one of our early presentations. So Alan, if we have some hands raised, that would be great. Questions, anybody? Hands, physical or digital? <laughs> Not seeing any. Okay, so um, let's um, move now, if we could to, I believe next on our agenda is some uh, general discussion of the presentations. And um, so I, uh, I don't want to put people in the position of being called on, but I do have some, you know, I, I did want to ask a couple people for, uh, things, but Alan, if you could help monitor if people wants to, if someone wants to talk in general or have uh, follow up or their insights about what we've heard, um, please uh, let, them, let them speak. No problem. Uh, Michael has uh, his hand raised. Hi. Uh... Yeah, Liz, you know, thanks a lot for that presentation. This is related more to uh, the feds in terms of some legislation I, I haven't dug into, but had heard about when it comes to states potentially being able to receive funds from um, the leasing process through BOEM. Um, I don't know if that's uh, currently being discussed or what the potential of that is. Obviously, you know, New Hampshire is a um, comparatively small state to some of those states to our south and resources, um, you know, are certainly important to being able to develop some of the supply chain opportunities in, in a host of different areas. But, um, you know, do you know of any uh, movement on that or any potential legislation that could sort of help um, states with this process and trying to develop um, and, and, you know, studies doing, you know, a lot of that, that work that's clearly needed. Um, you know, have, have you guys seen anything like that? From the federal level? Yes. No, right now, all the proceeds from the auctions go straight into the, the general fund. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that we have talked about um, to see if there, I mean, there is precedent uh, to, to sort of, I don't want to, earmark off some of that funding uh, for the development of offshore wind. I think it would be something that the states would have to come together to come together in more of a coalition and, and really um, ask, ask for it. I would encourage it. Um, I'm on record saying, I think it's a really good idea um, because you, you know, it's your ratepayers that are funding the development of offshore wind, that money is not going directly back into your ratepayers. So it would be good to have some of that, at least some of that money directed into port infrastructure, fishing, more fishing studies, uh, supply chain development work, um, mm -hmm. training, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Great. Thank you. If I could follow up on Michael's question, and, and I didn't know, is, is Commissioner Caswell still on? Are you still here, Commissioner? He is showing up here. So is he able to hear or can he speak or maybe he's not? I have asked him to unmute. 
Okay. Sorry, Senator. Hey, Commissioner. Thank How you. are you? I'm well. Um, I, I, just if I could throw a quick question your way, there is some. There was some discussion, a question from Michael uh, to Liz about if there's any awareness of federal funding or, or ways in which some some of the uh, money that's going into offshore wind development might come to the states and the suggestion that perhaps we could, it needs to be a coalition of the states that are involved uh, to work with the federal delegations and other, other ways. But I just wanted to ask um, you, since you know uh, we did have that uh, notice of the state of Maine getting the Department of Commerce um, funding, and, and just in general, what your thoughts are as a commissioner about what we can do to, um, give your new office a boost and to take advantage of, of some of these possibilities of developing New Hampshire businesses. Yes, well, I mean, I should start by thanking you, Senator, for uh, including that language in the legislation that you worked so hard on uh, to establish the Office of Outdoor Wind Industry Development in New Hampshire. Uh, I, I am looking forward to getting that um, established sooner rather than later, but of course, the issue that we all face in government is funding. Um, so we have looked at some op options that we could use uh, in the coming couple of months to pull that together. I know that uh, Maine has used uh, an economic development uh, EDA grant for that uh, purpose. Uh, I've had some conversations with uh, some of our friends in Washington around um, whether there might be an opportunity to have some funding that could be made available to all three states to help facilitate the Boehm process. Um, uh, in the sort of broader Gulf of Maine project, uh, because, you know, I, I think it makes some sense to have some regional cohesiveness uh, as we move forward here. I think there are certainly a lot of areas where uh, each state is going to have its own interests in mind. But I think for the most part, as it relates to the bone process, to the extent that there's uh, some collaboration and, uh, um, and, uh, synchronization, I think that would be really useful in moving all of this forward. Uh, to Tony Gentis' point earlier that this is, you know, looking at a long time, if we can um, use that type of cooperation to facilitate um, a more uh, robust uh, permitting process, taking into account all the, all the pieces that, you know, we're starting to hear about here to get tonight is, I think, really, really important. So kind of a long way, Senator, of saying we don't have the resources just yet, but we've got uh, a lot of uh, oars in the water um, uh, or uh, platforms in the water uh, waiting to see if, uh, what we can come up with here in the next couple of weeks. Well, thank you so much, Commissioner. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I thought it'd be a good opportunity um, because, you know, really your leadership and your offices, uh, your leadership is going to be important as we move forward. And just anything that this commission can do um, to help facilitate uh, your efforts. And as you know, I did talk with uh, Congressman Pappas and Senator Shaheen who's and their staff, and they're really anxious to help um, see if there are yeah. any federal support we could use. So, yeah. uh, I've had that, some of those, I've had some of those conversations as well, Senator, and I, and I, I do think that there might be some possibility, but um, these sorts, having these uh, conversations and raising the awareness of what an important um, issue this is for the state is really, really helpful um, as we sort of get all our ducks in a row. And that's it for my water analogies for today. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. And Alan, another uh, comment from the uh, commission on the presentations? Anybody else? Anybody? Okay, well, in the interest of time, let me just, uh, uh, in terms of commission planning, let you mention that the steering committee is looking at a sequence of presentations that Michael has helpfully put to uh, put together kind of a list. I think he's going to send you that list and we will be looking at trying to schedule presentations at some kind of priority order for, for the meetings over the next few months. And uh, we'll, that will be sent out to you. And if you have comments about topics or presentations or the order of them that you think we ought to um, we ought to look at, uh, you know, you can get them to me once uh, once you've received uh, this tentative um, list. And um, we are going to continue our monthly um, meetings and um, we will get those um, scheduled. And, you know, I, I think in the December meeting, there might be some information to be available about what bills 
perhaps have been filed by House members and the filing period for the Senate will open up if any of them, uh, you know, are in the area that the commission um, is there. And um, obviously at some point in time, we'll start to make our recommendations to the legislature, but that's, you know, it's premature uh, now to do that. I just wanted to, in terms of uh, planning. Um, and now, um, Alan, uh, we do have uh, time for public comment. If you want to open, open that up. We did just have a hand raised by Liz Burdick. One thing I, I did want to follow up with is uh, something that Annie said. Um, she said time is, is now to start working with the fishing community. I would highly also recommend that, that you all start having those discussions now with the fishing community. Um, you, you heard in Doug's presentation how long the permitting time frame is, you know, up to 10 years. Some things that states can do is help de-risk the sites and having those really fruitful conversations with the key stakeholders like the fishing community is going to be key. So that is one recommendation I would um, throw out there for you all. The second thing is I would also look at Denmark as a permitting model. So there's some, there's some one-stop shop types of uh, models out there and Denmark is one of them. So I would look to Denmark as a permitting model. Thank you so much for that good advice. And, um, you know, I, in putting this commission together, I was very concerned that we don't repeat the mistakes I think were made in down in Southern New England in terms of the uh, engagement of the fisheries uh, community and, um, and, and, you know, all the other potential users of the, of the Gulf too. So uh, that's great advice. And, um, and the permitting timeline is, uh, I just think it's a big concern and let us hope that um, once the, uh, BOEM and the environmental study gets done in Southern New England, it'll, it'll kind of open things up and with the more projects that are coming online that there gets to be some streamlining and we can learn from each other about how to, how to do that and get, get things moving along. So thank you. And uh, Alan, any, any other public comment? We have Ben Brown who has a hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Alan. And um, thank you, Senator Waters. I think this is going to fall to Michael, because uh, you had mentioned he was pulling together information for all of you. Um, but uh, Michael, if you need anything from the work that the University of Maine did on researching the Gulf of Maine to build the Maine Aquaventus project, um, or if you need anything on a New England floating technology, um, just let me know and I can, I can um, get that information and connect you with the people um, for that for the information both at the project level but then also at the state research level and then also the previous work that Boehm did when they did their um, site assessments of the Gulf of Maine many years ago when it was both the University of Maine and Statoil which is now Equinor investigating uh, the Gulf of Maine as a place for floating technologies. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ben. I appreciate that. I'll definitely be in contact. And then, you know, I do, um, Diane Foster from uh, UNH is also on the commission. And I think, you know, certainly bringing her into that discussion and um, trying to accumulate what both universities have done to begin to create some of that platform. That would be great. So thank you. Um, looks like we have Diane Foster has a question. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we certainly are interested. I, I did as somewhat of a tangent, UNH just received $600,000 from the Economic Development Authority for an energy water microgrid system. There's a recent article in the Union Leader you may want to see. It's both to formalize an existing microgrid out at Shoals, but also to then use it as an opportunity for public engagement for other islanded communities. Not completely relevant, but it will at least continue to build our capacity in this area that is of potential interest for offshore wind. And UNH keeps bringing in that grant money. Hooray. 25% <laughs> of UNH's um, research expenditures in 2018 were marine related. All right. All right. <laughs> Any other public comment or commission member comment, Alan? If uh, members of the public do have comments, you can raise your hand or you can press star nine if you're on the phone and we'll let you speak. Rick Maynard, I'm gonna bring him in. Go ahead, Rick, can you hear us? 
Yeah, you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, basically, I had, well, I'm looking at New Bedford being the only um, port presently in the United States that pursued uh, act opening to uh, facilitate the wind power. So what plans do we have north of there? Because it's the Cape between us, so it doesn't uh, do much. And another question would be purchase power agreements. That seems to be whether it's community power or, or base. That's one of the first steps after we get past uh, our permitting phase. Well, thank you so much, Rick, for those uh, questions. And, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why the commission is for offshore wind and port development, um, because we think there's great potential up here. And um, Commissioner Caswell's uh, office is undertaking a port um, feasibility study. And um, so that is, you know, recognition that, you know, we've got to see what we can uh, do. And, you know, certainly the procurement issue, I think, is going to be front and center. It's very complicated for this state and for each state to decide what they're doing. But I, you know, we do know that Massachusetts has uh, made, you know, very, very substantial commitments to procurement. Um, and so these are awfully important topics as we move forward. And I don't know if anybody else wanted to comment on Rick's, uh, Rick's question and comment. Alan, anyone else? Uh, work, is, work is training. Do you still hear me? Yes. Yeah. So we have two facilities on the East Coast right now. We see one in Virginia being developed, and we see the new Bedford Maritime on training uh, workers to work in the offshore wind industry. That seems uh, to be another important area. I mean, there's some cross training that took place. I'm a union electrician. I didn't work on the offshore rigs myself, but the people that were trained for this type of work, it seems, would migrate over towards the offshore wind, but I mean, we certainly like to have citizens of the New England, New Hampshire uh, be part of that workforce as well. Good point. 20,000 jobs, huh? Bring them, bring it on. <laughs> Any other comments or questions, uh, Alan? Yes, Ben Brown has his hand up. Um, Alan, I was just going to, uh, I was going to add to your question um, for the state of Maine. Uh, they're looking at Searsport. Um, and industry has looked at Searsport up here in Maine uh, as an offshore wind port. Uh, it's been used as a land-based wind port for uh, lay down and marshalling of components. Um, and then um, Sprague Energy operates a lot of the ports here along the East Coast up in Maine and in New Hampshire. So, um, um, and uh, as Senator Waters had said, um, you know, the state of New Hampshire is looking into those ports, but um, that's just my two cents to your question. Thank you. Anyone else, Alan? Anybody else? Please raise your hand or press star nine if you're on the phone. It doesn't look like it, Senator. Well, thank you so much. And look at this, it's 501. I really, it's important for commissions to keep to their time frame. We've done a pretty good uh, a job. Um, and uh, so you'll be hearing uh, from us with that list of potential topics for presentations and presenters and uh, your advice of what to add or the sequencing of it would be most um, welcome and we will meet in a in a month and um, we've got a lot before us but I think we're off to a really great start I want I do want to thank uh, Michael and um, and Matt and Mark um, so very much for their leadership uh, on the commission and uh, we actually do have to take a role to adjourn so um, I, or Alan, can we just do it by by consensus? I don't remember what we have to do. We probably have to take a roll call. I will do it from those who are present still in the meeting so we can do Thank it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no problem. I'll just go in the order. Um, Jim to Tom. I'm, I agree. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Senator Waters. Yes. Ben Brown. Yes. Diane Foster. Yes. Representative Somsich. Yes. Michael Berman. Yes. Doug Feaster. You can nod, Doug. We can take that. Okay. <laughs> Mark Liberté. I agree. All right. Um, Matthew Mayo. Yes. 
Sean Clancy? Yes. Uh, Vandan Devatia? Yes. Representative Jane Bolio? Yes. Tony Ginta? Yes. Diane Martin? Yes. Uh, Ted Deers? Yes. Uh, Taylor Caswell? Yes. Dan Shreve? Yes. Joe Casey? Yes. Jennifer Sis? Yes. Tim Roach? Tim Roach. You're on mute now, Tim. You agree to adjourn? All right, well, Tim's I, think, I think we can safely adjourn without it. Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're good. Thank you very much.